Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Thank you for sticking to time. Now, it's time for the next session. I met the coach Sri Durga, student from the Department of Computer Science, Central University, to deliver a welcome note about our next speaker. Now, I like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Sharma. He is having more than a decade of experience in industry and academia. He did his master's in computer science from DAV. Dear participants, sorry for the network glitches. I like to introduce our next speaker of this session, Dr. Sharma. Dr. Sharma is having more than a decade of experience in industry and academia. He did his master's in computer science from DAVV Indoor and got into doctoral bandwagon at India and Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi, under the mentorship of Professor Raghavan. He started his career as an enterprise application. a couple of prestigious organizations like Capgemini in past. He is currently working in the Department of Informatics, University of Petroleum, Energy Studies, Uttarakhand. He has mentored many successful startups and has served as one of the founding directors of CDC Global Solutions. He has conducted 33 successful international hackathons with academia and industrial collaborators such as IBM, STPI, Cardiff University, Intel, etc. He is also serving as mentor and advisor at IEEE, an annual international IEEE hackathon. His area of interest including data analytics, machine learning, rural development, entrepreneurship and sustainable design. He has published some research papers, books and articles with reputed publishers. We are so privileged for you to be with us this afternoon. Welcome sir. And I call Dr. Sharma to start the session. Hello, sir. Chandramani Sharma, sir.
सर कैन यू हियर मी इंद्रमणि शर्मा सर ये वेरी गुड आफ्टरनून ऑल ऑफ यू एम आई ऑडिबल यस सर यस सर प्लीज वेरी सॉरी फॉर द इंटरप्शन आई गॉट ऑल राइट सो माय वॉइस इज क्लियर टू यू परफेक्टली सर ओके थैंक यू so are you able to see my screen as well yes sir okay so a very good afternoon one and all i could not hear the introduction and uh, uh, the initial part of the uh, this particular session and uh, i welcome you all in this uh, session on deep learning so a uh, during all the meeting could have got some understanding of deep learning and machine learning and data analytics so uh, what is the difference between deep learning and machine learning do you understand yes do you understand what is deep learning yes sir they are putting it in the chat box okay so let me just all right the deep learning has more hidden layers okay so uh, how many of you are just new to the world of data science or just attending first time any fdb related to data analytics machine learning could you please just raise your hands if it is possible i think uh, there is an option for that okay so there is a uh, one hand raised so i assume that rest of you are having some understanding of data analytics and uh, this machine learning and deep learning so let me just first introduce you you know some of the basic concepts of this entire thing the data analytics machine learning and deep learning and then the today's topic of discussion is auto encoders so we'll be talking about this that uh, in the entire realm where this auto encoder concept fits into so as we know that data science is you know one of the buzzwords today and uh, lots of people are moving uh, towards this towards the data analytics data science and machine learning and deep learning why because it is able to solve many problems of today and uh, uh, for which that you cannot write the program so how the machine learning is different from an ordinary program suppose you are you just want to solve a problem uh, you want to get the factorial of a given number so uh, you can develop a logic for that like uh, there is a number for which you need to calculate the factorial so you just need to repeatedly uh, cumulatively need to multiply uh, the different uh, preceding numbers to the number itself and you'll get the factorial but there are certain problems suppose you just want to identify whether an image belongs to cat or dog so it will be very difficult to write the programs so the deep learning machine learning are applied to the tasks where we cannot see an intuitive logic we cannot write the logic for uh, you know such problems 
and pattern recognition is one of them. Suppose you want to recognize <clears throat> that uh, what is there in an image. You just want to recognize the voice of a person and want to convert it into text. Or you want to do various other types of uh, uh, you know, pattern recognition tasks. Then machine learning comes uh, handy in solving those problems. So what is the approach of machine learning? You have lots of data. And uh, from that particular data, you try to figure out the logic. So maybe the data is labeled. Uh, it is having you know various levels, various classes. And uh, you try to figure out that how those classes are being formed. So that is the basic idea of machine learning. And uh, if we talk about the traditional programming or traditional logic building with the help of uh, you know the, the 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 program building. So what is there inside that? We we already know the logic. We provide some input and we get the output. But in machine learning, we provide input, we provide the output as well, and we try to figure out the uh, the logic behind that. So the machine learning uh, algorithms or the deep learning algorithms are basically the function approximation approaches. So where there is input, there is uh, some sort of output and we try to figure out that how that particular output is being generated. What is this function that is generating that output? So that is the whole idea of uh, this uh, machine learning and machine learning has been existing for decades. And the deep learning concept is based on the notion of artificial neural networks. So it takes motivation from our nervous system uh, where there are millions or billions of neurons uh, connected, interconnected. And uh, then the information is processed uh, through various sensors. So they, the nervous system is having its uh, network in the entire body. It sends signals to the uh, to the to the brain and the brain uh, with the complex computation architecture it figures out that what is happening in the body so the idea has been taken from there but in 2012 something happened that uh, drawn the attention of the entire research community towards this uh, deep learning so basically there was an image classification task that people thought that uh, it is something very interesting that uh, if there are thousands of categories of the objects and uh, we have some labeled data available with us and we want to train a classifier which can recognize the different categories of objects. So uh, for that, there used to be an ImageNet uh, you know, challenge and uh, that is annually held at an international conference. That is an annual uh, you know, competition for recognizing the different categories of the uh, you know, objects. So earlier, the SVM-based classifiers or the random forest-based classifiers or the ensemble-based uh, you know, methods prior to uh, 2012 were the winners. But uh, suddenly in 2012, one architecture was proposed based on this, uh, uh, this deep learning or that we may call it convolutional neural network. And that came up with the accuracy of improvement of more than 15%. So the entire world was uh, taken aback and was surprised. And people started exploring this particular you know, uh, field of deep learning. And later on, it was implemented by various companies for solving their uh, various problems. So today, many of the personal assistants, whether it is uh, Google personal assistant, whether it is iPhone, Siri. So they are using the trained models which are based on uh, some deep learning architectures. So this is how the entire you know, uh, paradigm has been shifting to this. And now everyone is talking about deep learning. And uh, Google has made the life and the experience of learning uh, these entire you know, thing a very convenient. So earlier, uh, there was a bottleneck or there was a kind of uh, you know, restriction that first you need to have uh, a, a, a proper architecture where you can train your model. You should have GPU system 
or you should have access to some cloud platform where you can <coughs> train the deep learning models because the deep learning models uh, so they can perform better when there is huge uh, huge you know size of the data available so larger the size of the data the better it can perform and better it can overcome uh, the problem of overfitting so the you know the normal denomination uh, for deep learning models uh, for for as far as the data is concerned that should be tens of thousands it means if you have uh, samples in the range of 1 lakh or 2 lakh or 10 lakh then you can do something remarkable with deep learning <clears throat> so earlier training you know such a huge amount of data and uh, uh, and uh, and so so there was a kind of uh, restriction uh, on the individuals they cannot perform you know deep learning uh, either they need to buy the very heavy infrastructure uh, for the deep learning or they need to go to cloud but now today we are able to discuss these models and uh, there is this google collab facility uh, that google is providing you and there are various other cloud platforms like you can go to amazon you can go to uh, you know even google cloud for doing some serious stuff so uh, today we are going to discuss about uh, something that is auto encoder and uh, we are going to implement it in keras so are you aware of this keras library what is this keras how is it used have you had a session on this the basics of keras no sir okay so uh, in next couple of minutes let me you just get you started with keras so what is keras keras is a python open source library so it is basically a front end at back end it can support various other you know libraries for deep learning like it can go with uh, tensorflow it can go with theano it can work with microsoft uh, cntk uh, it can even work with r so there are different back ends uh, at which this uh, keras library can work and uh, it was developed uh, in year 2014 or 15 uh, by a Google engineer called as Francois Chollet. So he created this library. And uh, this is a very popular, or I may say that uh, the most popular library which is being used by the machine learning, uh, the de deep learning practitioners. And uh, at the back end, it supports TensorFlow. But uh, the learning curve of uh, TensorFlow is a kind of a steep. It means you, you need to invest lots of efforts in learning TensorFlow. At its core, but Keras is very easy, and uh, getting started with Keras is very, you know, convenient. So, if you want to read about this Keras, some of the basics of Keras. So, there is a website, uh, or you may say the the official uh, portal for Keras that is Keras dot io. Once you open this page, so you'll get lots of things about this Keras that how to get started with what it can do. It comes with a very, you know, good uh, documentation. And here is a very basic Keras API reference, like what is there in the Keras. So as we know that deep learning models can be of two types, either we can create sequential models. So as you know, the deep learning models are just the stacking of the layers. So there are different types of layers, like there is input layer where you are just feeding your data. Then there will be different, uh, you know, uh, there will be dense layers, uh, which, uh, which may be having various number of neurons and they can be performing various functions in the, in the network. If you're working with images, then you can go with the convolutional architectures so we have con 2d architecture we can do upsampling downsampling based on different uh, you know layers and uh, at the end you try to provide or you try to produce some output so how the learning happens you feed in your data there are different layers in the deep network the data is passed to them and there are different neurons based on the activation uh, criteria every neuron will try to produce some output 
So based on the activation uh, function that you are using, the neuron may fire or it may not fire. It means it may activate or it may not activate. So once uh, you reach at the final layer, so there are certain levels or some expected output uh, at the each uh, output uh, neuron. Then you compare that what is being produced by the network and what actually it should produce. So there is some actual value and there is some predicted value. You try to figure out the difference or the error based on a function and uh, that is called a, a kind of loss function that how much you deviate from the uh, from the you know from the standard uh, standard output that was expected and uh, whatever error you are getting you need to back propagate that because you were supposed to get one but you are getting point uh, three so there is a difference of point seven. So you need to back propagate that particular error. So for that, you need to calculate the derivative of the of the function and you need to back propagate the error that from where it emerged and uh, how you need to update the weights in the uh, network architecture. So learning happens when you come backward uh, and you try to optimize it. So there are the, uh, you need an optimization algorithm. You may use uh, you know, different types of optimization algorithm. There are different types of optimizers. So this Keras provides you mechanism for all of this stuff. So here you can see that there are different types of layers and uh, the models can be either it can be sequential or it can be functional. So there is a model class and there is a sequential class. With sequential class, we can just create linear or sequential models. But uh, with the help of model class, we can create non-sequential network architectures. So then you can go inside and can explore that what is there inside, uh, you know, all of this. And then there are different types of layers. So based on what you want to perform uh, at a given layer, there are different types of uh, layers, like there are convolutional layers, there are certain core layers. So more than uh, 80 types of layers exist in this Keras API that can help you in performing various uh, tasks, uh, starting from the very base layers, some activation layers, pooling layers, convolutional layers, uh, some pre-processing layers, some recurrent layers. Uh, if you want to uh, overcome the problem of overfitting, then there is uh, there are regularization uh, layers, attention layers, and all of this. And then you can have certain callback APIs. It means you can, uh, you know, uh, modify or you can just do a tailoring to the network architecture. If you want to modify some of the uh, some of the working of the uh, default functions, then you can write your own callbacks. So these are just the functions. Then for data pre-processing and all, all, so optimizers. When we are trying to optimize or trying to reduce that error uh, that we are getting at the, you know, as the final output. So there are different types of optimizers like SGD, RMS prop, Adam, Ada Delta, Ada Grad, Adam X, Nadam and FTRL. So this Nadam and FTRL have been added, uh, you know, recent in recent years, and they are based on the research uh, done by various. You know, people because there were certain problems in the previous uh, optimizers, and definitely they are working at that particular level. Then you can figure out that how much accurate is your model. So based on uh, you know whether you are performing regression or classification, there are different types of accuracy matrix, and then you have various types of losses. So these are just the categories. Like uh, if you want to probabilistic losses, regression losses. So there are different categories and then you'll find different uh, uh, functions associated with them. And uh, then there are built-in data sets that you can play around with this. You, you do not uh, need to have uh, any extra uh, data set. So MNIST, CIFAR 10 and CIFAR 100. So there are different types of data sets available. And uh, Inside applications, there are certain pre-trained models. So uh, during these two days, we'll be discussing, uh, you know, some of these concepts. Like tomorrow, we'll be discussing the concept of transfer learning and fine tuning. 
then we'll be talking about that something which is already trained uh, something which is already available uh, to you as far as deep learning is concerned so you can utilize you can reuse that uh, in your uh, for solving your uh, you know various problems so there are various pre trained deep learning architectures including exception efficient net vgg 16 vgg 19 resnet and all of all of them and uh, you can use them for your specific tasks because uh, they've been trained on uh, you know on on like on the data set that have the denominations of tens of thousands so if you do not have that much of data and you do not have that much of resource but you if you want to solve some uh, some image uh, recognition task so you can use this and that is uh, with the help of transfer learning so this is how you can get started with uh, you know the keras so this is just the api it contains everything and you need to explore it a bit uh, so how to get started with keras in in uh, uh, google colab that's very easy i think you understand that how to use google colab so google colab is just a you know free to use uh, a deep learning platform or machine learning platform which uh, comes with all the nuts and bolts that you require to play around this data analytics uh, machine learning and deep learning task so you do not have to install any uh, package or any you know extra thing for doing uh, you know these things but obviously if you require some extra packages then you can install that and uh, so what is deep learning deep learning is mostly used for regression or classification uh, so you have some data and data is generally some annotated data which comes with uh, you know some labels like if you want to classify uh, the two categories of the objects dogs or cats so you will have that particular data labeled and uh, then you can construct your own model architecture and then you can uh, train your model and then uh, the, the classification is done if you are performing regression then the regression can also be done uh, in that way so these are the supervised learning techniques and uh, as far as unsupervised learning is concerned so deep learning is, is still uh, you know in the infancy it is just in the process of evolution that how it can be used for solving various unsupervised learning tasks so today the kind of machine learning that we are going to discuss is somewhat representational learning or self supervised learning it means here we will not provide the classes of the data and we will try to figure out we will try to modify the data in some intermediate representation and uh, auto encoder will be used for that and uh, interestingly auto encoder is not uh, you know something uh, different it is just the just a network architecture where you just have uh, one encoder and one decoder so what is the meaning of encoder and decoder suppose you are having milk and uh, out of milk you just converted or transformed milk into a powder so you are having dry powder with you and uh, wherever you want then you can construct milk out of that so that is the entire process of uh, this auto encoder there is encoding phase and there is a decoding phase and it depends on you that how you perform this encoding and how you perform the decoding because there is not uh, much help is available on that and what are the applications of encoder so uh, auto encoders can be used as a tool for uh, dimensionality reduction you can reduce the size of the data by manifold and uh, then you can reconstruct that and it is better than other dimensionality reduction techniques like pca and lda uh, because uh, as we know lda and pca are, can be used primarily for a uh, linear uh, you know uh, on the uh, on the data that has some linear relationships and we can uh, reduce its uh, dimensionality but since uh, neural networks are good to represent uh, non linear relationships as well 
so they perform better and they have you know larger scope uh, for uh, this dimensionality reduction but there is a problem with uh, with the uh, auto encoders and the problem is uh, yes uh, uh, they can obviously uh, perform better on a specific data as compared to you know pca because they can represent the nonlinear relationships but they can solve only one type of encoder architecture can solve only one type of problem and you need to have custom auto encoders for solving every problem suppose you want to uh, solve the problem of construction uh, uh, means encoding and decoding of faces suppose there are certain images and you have created an auto encoder and that is compressing the faces so if you have created an auto encoder for faces so it may not work on uh, you know on the compression or doing some other step on the images of dogs if you have created an auto encoder for the images of dogs then it may not perform better in recognizing computers or or some uh, doing some sort of uh, a dimensionality reduction on computers so there is one a drawback of auto encoder and uh, that drawback is that they are highly uh, data dependent so is it is it clear does it make sense this entire thing so what are the auto encoders auto encoders are just you are converting milk into uh, powder you are condensing it and then you are again able to make milk out of the powder so when you are converting milk into powder so that particular process will be called uh, the encoding and when you are converting powder into milk then that will be called as decoding <clears throat> so there is input data and uh, after applying encoder we get a code so whatever we get as the output of the code of, of the encoder then that is called the code and then we apply decoder on the code and we get the output so let's get started that what is written here and what we are going to do so we are just creating a simple auto encoder and uh, the auto encoders can be of different types you can just have a simple neural network for uh, for creating uh, auto encoders you can use convolutional neural networks for creating uh, you know auto encoders and uh, there is a very interesting uh, application of auto encoders that is to generate some uh, synthetic data from the auto encoder and that is called generative uh, you know modeling or creating some some synthetic data so that is quite interesting and that is called variational auto encoder so we'll be talking about that what that how a basic encoder works and uh, how we can uh, create a variational auto encoder for uh, creating some uh, data based on its uh, learning so that will be a kind of synthetic uh, image generation exercise so what is written in this uh, you know piece of code as you know that uh, i am working here on uh, this uh, google code and uh, google colab i think in the previous session also you you know that how to create a uh, colab file so let's get started here the first statement is import keras so the keras library is already available uh, with this colab so we do not have to install it separately even we do not need tensorflow so everything is available here and we are just importing these two things we are importing keras and we are importing layers from this keras there are different types of layers that we just uh, saw based on the uh, type of task that we are solving what is the objective here <coughs> will be loading some of the images from a data set will be reducing it uh, uh, with a fraction of 32 so that is going to be our encoding dimension it means if our data is of 64 uh, size of 64 then uh, uh, we'll be just encoding it uh, into 32 and uh, the compression factor will be of 2. So here we, we are going to work with the uh, MNIST data set and uh, 
amnist is just a data set of you know digits so there are 10 types of digits 0 to 9 and the digits are uh, binary uh, or the grayscale uh, images and there are 60000 images in this amnist data set and the size of one image is 28 by 28 so uh, we'll be converting that into a linear array uh, of numpy and 28 by 28 will be converting into 784 and the encoding dimension it means the the, uh, the value that we'll get after the 784 so 784 ever is our higher dimension will be mapping it to 32 so here you can see if we map 784 into 32, then its compression will be of 24.5. Suppose you were having, uh, you know, 3 kg of milk and uh, you are just getting 1 kg of, you know, condensed milk or powder. So you can figure out that uh, what, what is the compression factor or the what, what level of compression you are achieving from that. So it is just like that. And then what we are doing, we, we are just defining a neural network. So inside Keras, uh, we are calling this input. So it is a layer uh, to which we'll be redirecting our input. And our input will be an image of size 28 by 28. So we'll be converting 28 by 28 into some linear uh, you know, array. And that will be having the linear size of 784. So we have created, uh, you know, the dimension for our input image, and uh, we have defined uh, this input for our for our network. Then what we are going, we are trying to define encoding layer, means how the encoding would be done. So for encoding, we are just creating a dense layer. So in dense layer, the first thing that uh, we need to define is that how many neurons are going to be in that particular uh, layer. So that is that uh, uh, this is 32. So there will be 32 neurons and uh, the activation is ReLU. So there are different types of activation functions like we can have sigmoid, we can have softmax, we can have ReLU, we can have ALU. So there are different types of activation functions and activation functions just decide that what value uh, will a neuron produce, whether it will produce some value, whether it will fire or not. So that is decided with this, uh, you know, activation function. And uh, this layer is connected to this particular input image. So this input uh, image, which is an uh, input of 780 uh, linear values, so it is being connected to this particular dense layer. And that dense layer is just having 32 neurons. And what is next? Next, we are deciding uh, that how we are going to decode. So here we are not uh, defining any complex architecture. What we are doing, we are just having one layer which will be used for encoding. And then there is another layer which will be used for decoding. So in this decoding, we have taken 784 value and that is the number of neurons so this is our output uh, layer and here we'll be getting 784 different values and these 784 values are representing the pixels in the image because the image is binary uh, image of uh, size 28 by 28 so there will be 784 pixel values and every pixel value is binary uh, so here uh, we are using this sigmoid uh, activation function because we want to get something with, which is 0 or 1. And then this decoding will be performed on the encoding. So we'll be giving input to the this, uh, uh, this decoding layer and uh, that is encoding. So what we have done, there is a data uh, which is of uh, dimension of 784, 784 ko map uh, in the linear dimension of 32 and then out of 32 we are reconstructing 784. So that is the basic idea of uh, this, uh, 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 this encoding. So there is encoder and there is decoder and uh, then we need to define an auto encoder. What will be the auto encoder? 
auto encoder will take your input so whatever input you are giving it will produce uh, some some intermediate result and then that intermediate result will be passed to decoder so auto encoder will work as a mechanism to uh, to map an input image into the decoded image so it means when you are decoding then definitely there will be some sort of you know variations and those variations need to be checked at pixel level so suppose you entered one image of 28 by 28 and uh, you are getting some output which is the uh, which is the decoded uh, image out of the reconstruction then how much variation is there so for that you have defined a model and it is learning from input image and uh, so this input image is the input and this decoded is the output so it will learn it like that and this model is just a you know a, a functional a model class which is available in keras uh, as i told you that models can be of two types either they can be sequential or uh, there is a functional api uh, which is available in the form of this model class and that can be used for uh, creating uh, the models that may have more flexibility so if you have had some previous session so their sequential model would have been used because that is something people start uh, you know uh, start with or start learning but here we are using this model class because here we need to define that what is the our input and how we want the output to be okay so these are just the layers that we have defined uh, in the form of encoded and decoded now we can construct an encoder that will do some sort of mapping and that will be a model in it, it's in itself and uh, that will map input image into some encoded uh, this encoded representation and uh, here uh, encoder model is defined that way in the same way we can define our decoder and uh, for decoder what we need to do before that we need to tell that what will be the input and what will be the output so for decoder uh, we'll take encoded input as the input something which has been converted into you know lower dimension of 32 and uh, it will be mapped to uh, the, the higher dimension and that is of the size 784 so first in encoding we are converting 784 into 32 and then 32 needs to be mapped to 784 and uh, what we are getting we are getting this last layer because auto encoder is having you know this input and uh, uh, this uh, input image and encoded it means it is taking both sorry this one so it is taking both encoder and decoder so we can just take the last layer from this and uh, can just figure out that what is the last layer so last layer was this one uh, this particular layer and uh, that can be just you know mentioned here with this minus one attribute so uh, since you would have uh, studied the the different basic uh, you know data structures in python and uh, then you would have studied this concept of indexing and slicing so if there is a list or there is some you know a string then you can have the neg negative indexing and whenever you refer minus one so minus one always refers to the last element minus one refers to the last element so here if you want to get the last layer uh, from your auto encoder which is uh, this layer which is this particular decoder layer so that you can uh, you know refer and the decoder can be defined like this decoder is something which is taking some encoded input it means that has been condensed and it is produ producing some uh, some decoded uh, output so this decoder is basically just converting condensed milk or just uh, converting the powder into milk again so this is how we need to define these things and uh, then we are just going to compile this particular uh, you know this auto encoder so as you know that how the deep learning models are compiled 
So for compilation, you need to provide two things. One is called optimizer and another one is called loss. And uh, with this updation of the weights, when you produce some output and then you get some, uh, uh, you know, some error, then that error needs to be back propagated in the network and then learning takes place. And that is repeated uh, over various iterations. So that is defined by number of epochs that you are uh, training the network on. So we have created an auto encoder and then this auto encoder needs to be, uh, you know, compiled because before training the network, we need to compile it. So there we need to provide uh, two arguments, the optimizer that how the that particular uh, error will be back propagated. So uh, this is uh, here, there is Adam and the loss is binary cross entropy. Why this binary cross entropy? Because you are having an image of 28 by 28. So total there are 784 pixels. And uh, at the end, you'll be just comparing that what was pixel I in, uh, you know, in an original image and uh, what value for that particular pixel you are getting in the uh, in the decoded image. If there is some variation, then that can be figured out with this binary. So even though we are having this size of 784, uh, but still we are using a binary cross entropy because this uh, mapping or this, uh, you know, decision has to be made at pixel level. So it is the uh, uh, level decision for every pixel we need to you know, decide it. That's why we are using a binary cross entropy. And uh, if you want to have, you know, data uh, which is in, into multiple classes, then you can use categorical cross entropy. You can use a sparse categorical cross entropy based on that. What are the different, uh, you know, types of classes, whether those are categorical or numerical ones. So uh, here we compile our auto encoder and uh, let's execute these cells for so for executing this cell where we have defined our encoded layer and decoded layer and we have uh, created one auto encoder model and here we are just defining you know two other models encoder and decoder so total there are three models so one is auto encoder one is just encoder and one is decoder. So even if you just uh, want to uh, check that how much loss is there in your data and you do not want to picturize the images, that how the reconstruction is happening, then you do not need to specify this encoder and decoder. And only this auto encoder will uh, you know, work if you just want to see the loss. But if you want to picturize the output, that original image was this, it was uh, converted into some lower dimensional uh, representation. And then from that representation, we got some higher dimension data and uh, that we want to pictureize that how good it reconstructed the images. So in that case, you would be required uh, to these encoder and decoders. Otherwise, if you just want to see the losses, then auto encoder can work. Uh, for that, okay, let's run this cell, this one, and this one. So this is pretty interesting. Here we are working with MDIS dataset, and at this particular point of time, we are going to load it. So there are seven, eight uh, types of data sets available with this Keras API. And MNIST is one of them. There is CIFAR 10. So there are 10 categories of the objects. There are CIFAR 100. Uh, there is Reuters dataset. And there is IMDB dataset. So performing various tasks, <clears throat> you have some of the datasets available with you. But if you want to work with your own dataset, then there is there are different types of you know, functions available that you can load your dataset from the directory as well. So since uh, uh, since this particular session is dedicated to this auto encoder and uh, it forms a part of advanced deep learning so we are not going to discuss that thing that how to load the images and uh, uh, how to do some sort of pre-processing with the images 
so that can be easily done and there are various types of data generators like you can flow from the directory and you can load your data and then do some sort of data augmentation on that but uh, here our main emphasis is on, is on auto encoder and what uh, they can do and okay so in the first step we are just trying to import the amnes data set which is available in zipped format uh, of numpy arrays so this is available in dot npg format so npg is numpy zipped format and uh, uh, it will be imported and uh, will be using this numpy for performing this uh, you know this multiplication operation so we are using this numpy we are importing this numpy and uh, then there is a wrapper load data and uh, amnest is the data set so it will load the data set and the data set will be divided into you know two parts so there there will be training data set as well as testing data set and since we are working on representational machine learning or self supervised learning where we do not need the class levels so this particular data set will have x train means the images uh, the training images it will also have the labels of corresponding to those images whether uh, a given sample is 1 2 3 4 5 so there are 60000 images and corresponding to those images there will be 60000 uh, labels associated with that but here we do not want to work with labels because we are just playing with the data we are taking data we are representing it some intermediate format and then we are just transforming that intermediate format into its original uh, form so that is something but uh, for that thing we do not need class levels so since we are not working with class levels so you can uh, treat it as unsupervised learning <laughs> or you can say it that it is self supervised learning uh the algorithm is working the model is working it is doing some you know intermediate representation and then it is trying to reconstruct that so it is just like uh, you know mosaicing of the images or just trying uh, there are different pieces of something and you just divide a thing into different pieces and then try to reconstruct out of those pieces so it is something like that and that needs to be the self supervised learning no one is monitoring you have to learn it from uh, you know uh, from from your uh, own mistakes and uh, like if there is a child and uh, there are various games in the age group of 3 to 5 that there are different toys and out of those you know uh, those parts uh, of the uh, of the toy game the kid need to reconstruct you know something like Uh, the kid needs to reconstruct the railway track and then need to you know join different parts to form the railway track then need to uh, re reconstruct the train and need to put it and then need to place you know different sign boards so that is how uh, there are different uh, the the entire set is available and once you dismantle that into different parts then out of those different parts you are trying to reconstruct the original uh, you know thing so that is the basic idea of auto encoders so there is encoding and there is decoding phase so uh, while loading this data set uh, we have just kept this underscore that means that we do not need it and by default whatever value uh, you know you are dealing with that is that goes uh, in this underscore you know default variable of python so here it just simply means that uh, we do not need the class levels we just need the data so the training data will be uh, loaded in x train variable and the testing data will be loaded in uh, x test variable and uh, what we are doing we are just trying to normalize this particular data so this particular data will be uh, you know in a given range because there are pixels and pixels may have different densities since it is just a uh just a binary data and the pixels will be having either black or white color so the pixel may have just uh, either uh, 0 to 55 intensity levels so 
but the neural networks work with the small data so smaller are the values the better they will perform so it is their inherent uh, property so what we'll do that whatever pixel values we are having we'll try to normalize it in the range of 0 to 1 so what we are doing so whatever values we are having here so that we are going to convert in this uh, float 32 representation so if there are integer density values they they need to be converted into you know float and we are just dividing it with 255 so 255 if you just mention here dot it is 255.0 so that is uh, you know how the float values can be accepted in python so for x train and for x test for both uh, the images you are doing uh, you know this particular uh, normalization operation so the pixel values are going to be normalized in the range of 0 to 1 why we are doing this because the uh, neural networks work better on the small values so if the values are in the range of 0 to 1 then uh, the computation load will be less and they can uh, th they can work well with uh, the smaller values in the range of 0 to 1 so here we just uh, converted our data set the uh, the training images and the test images in the range of 0 to 1 with this normalization and then what we are doing here uh, the x train uh, we are just converting into a linear uh, means uh, it is in the uh, shape of 28 by 28 into 1 so the 28 is the height and 28 is the width and there is just one channel we just want to convert into some linear array of 60,000 samples 60,000 are the total images and uh, uh, the, the total images in this uh, x text and uh, the 10,000 that we are taking, that is for uh, this uh, test image. So what we are doing, uh, we are just finding out that what is the length of this particular data set. So the length will be the total number of images here. And then uh, 28 by 28, we just need to convert it into, uh, you know, something uh, which, is, uh, which is 784. So here we are using this uh, product. And if you just print the value of this particular, you know, quantity, so it will be just 28 comma 28. And that is how the indexing uh, works. And uh, in the same X text, we are just converting into that how many images are there in the data set. And uh, that needs to be converted. We just need to multiply height and width, and then we'll get its corresponding you know, value. So 28 into 28 uh, will be just converted into 70, 80, 784. And uh, after printing and loading its value, so we are getting here uh, these two, the, the shape of the X train is 60,784. And the X test means there are 10,000 testing images and there are 60,000 uh, training images in the data set. And uh, yeah, we can print it uh, with this shape. And then we need to fit it. So when we fit some model, so fit means we want to perform training. And when we are, we want to perform training, then uh, we can, we need to provide certain things. So the two arguments are mandatory when we perform, you know, training. So the first one is the, Here the X train, it means the data and uh, uh, it means the input, what we want as the output. So uh, that is our expected output and how many times we want to repeat this particular process. How many times we want to repeat that particular process that will be specified with number of epochs uh, for how many times we want to perform particular training. So autoencoder dot fit, and uh, if it would have been any, uh, you know, classification task, so what would we have given here? The features and the class levels, but here we do not want to uh, 
get our data mapped to some class level. We just want to get the original image back. So we are just providing the image and we want to get the original image. And for that, we want to perform this training. And then there is, there is a model which is defined with this particular auto encoder variable. And that is just a user given variable. You can just keep its name, uh, you know, anything. So there are uh, 50 uh, epochs. And since this, there are, you know, a uh, large number of images, the 60,000 images in this uh, X underscore train uh, variable. So you cannot load all the images and can perform the training. So what is there that you can load the images in the, you know, in the small batch sizes. So here we are using 256 and uh, uh, the one batch of images will be of 256 and 60,000 images will go in the batches. And then we can have the shuffle as true means when we are performing this training, then the, the shuffling will be there. And uh, the validation data, validation is data is something uh, that will be checking, will be uh, training our model for one epoch and uh, will also perform the validation uh, on that particular epoch. So here, that particular data has been specified here. So there is X test, which is the input and X underscore test, that is the output. So we want the mapping in that way. And uh, if you do not specify here, then you'll just get the loss if you specify this validation data then you'll get two types of losses one is for validation and another one is the training loss and uh, loss is something uh, which will tell you that how much accurate you are to the uh, actual reconstruction so once you start it you start the training so there are 50 epochs here and uh, you can see that when the training is being performed that it is moving like this so there are 235 by 235 it means every epoch is having these many of steps so how these steps are there because you are loading your data uh, in the form of batches so here 256 uh, batch size is there it means one batch will have 256 images and there are 60,000 images if you divide 60,000 with the uh, uh, 256 then you'll get something around 235 so 235 but, uh, steps will be there in each epoch and uh, it will perform training like that it is learning and here you can see that how the variation in the loss is there so this is the loss based on the training uh, data and this is the loss based on the uh, based on the testing data so the trading will be performed. There are 50 epochs and uh, it is better to perform it as many as epochs that you can afford to get the better understanding, to get the, get the better representational learning from the model. Okay, since our this uh, data set is moderate in size, so we are able to perform the training here and the size of the images is just 28 by 28. So if the size of images is large, then depending on the size of the data, the training duration may vary. So finally, uh, the, <coughs> the training loss was 0 0.0925 and uh, the validation loss was something like this and uh, that was being performed for 50 epochs and uh, it what it has learned the model has learned just the uh, intermediate representations and codings and encodings means how an image is going to be mapped to 32 uh, you know a, a dimension out of 784 and how the reconstruction is there and when the reconstruction reconstructed image was matched against the original image pixel by pixel then the loss was something like this and uh, it got updated across all the 
epox so this is how the auto encoder is being trained auto encoder is just a neural network where you are just defining encoding layer and decoding layer and the encoders and decoders and uh, here we have created three models one is encoder another one is uh, decoder and there is third model which is auto encoder so auto encoder is doing this if you just want to see that how much accurate uh, the encoding can be performed uh, with this model then you can just get an idea from this but if you want to get a representation means how the decoded or the reconstructed output looks like so for that we we should have encoder and decoder also with us so after performing this uh, training what we want to get we want to get that what our encoded images are and what our decoded images are and uh, that prediction we can get from here so encoded images are it means we are performing some prediction we want our system to work so encoder model is already uh, you know there okay so so if you want to just get the prediction out of this so for that prediction what we can do we are just using this uh, encoder dot predict so obviously that needs to be uh, compiled and trained first uh, on the images and then this is decoded images that we are getting and uh, are using it for prediction and uh, we can display back these you know the results so for that we are using this uh, matplotlib and dot pyplot okay okay so this is encoded images and uh, these are the decoded images and what we are doing here we just want to see that what our original images are and what their corresponding uh, decoded images are okay once we do this then here we can see that this particular code is plotting our original images and this particular code is uh, displaying our reconstructed images so we entered some images and then encoder represented uh, that in some binary represent some intermediate representation and from that intermediate representation we got the reconstructed images and then we are displaying it back so here you can see that these are the original images and uh, when we are reconstructing then uh, so th this is the reconstructed images 72104 and uh, you know 5 and 9 so obviously there is some you know loss of the data and uh, this remapping this reconstruction is lossy and uh, we can create different types of you know uh, models based on the data that we are using okay so this is just a basic idea of auto encoders how they can be used and uh, how they can map some data into some lower dimension and then we can get back the original dimension from the uh from the intermediate uh, representation so do you have any query did you understand this basic concept that how this reconstruction can be there can be uh, you know implemented and what auto encoder 
mean if you have any questions then please ask excuse me sir yes yes please sir these uh, auto encoders can be applied on only image data or, or can be applied in some other data also like in inclusion detection system in yeah yeah models. definitely that is a very good question so uh, they can be applied on any type of data and uh, uh, they can be used like uh, there is a concept called as variational auto encoder that uh, we are going to discuss shortly that how they can be used and uh, uh, you can use these auto encoders or this particular concept for uh, for generation of the data and that generation of the data can be anything like you are generating text you are generating images and uh, uh, you can use it for time series data for some sort of prediction of the you know next text or anything like that so they can be used for uh, for any type of data but uh, uh, since there is a universal you know truth about these machine learning and deep learning models that whatever data we have that needs to be first converted into uh, numbers because apart from numbers we cannot uh, learn from anything so there is no algorithm that can learn from you know uh, anything except numbers so now the question ari arises that if we have image type of data so obviously we can convert it into uh, you know numbers because there are pixels and their corresponding values intensity values so we can get the numbers but we if we have text data so how to convert text into you know numbers if we have some speech data how to convert speech into numbers because ultimately whatever uh, we have to feed uh, to the network that needs to be in the form of numbers so there are various you know layers that can support you for doing that suppose you are working with textual data then you can use embedding layer and uh, you can have the representation of a text into uh, numbers and there are various mechanisms for doing that like uh, you just want to convert a text into numbers then you can have you know uh, the the vector encodings available and uh, uh, like word to vector so there are various embeddings trained embeddings available to convert your text into uh, you know numbers but ultimately any type of data needs to be converted into numbers and you can work with various types of uh data you can work with text you can work with the speech you can work with images you can work with video so yeah it works with the uh, all types of data it is not just uh, confined to uh, images or something like that okay yes any other question Sir, uh, sir. Yes, yes, please. Yeah, can you speak uh, something on uh, related to some classification data apart from images? Like I am working on intrusion detection system, so I found okay. like uh, many people are working now. They are uh, using auto encoders for uh, classification of attacks. Okay. So I just want to know how is uh, I want to work uh, with the data. Uh, basically, auto encoders are not good for classification. because in classification what we work we have some data the labels are already you know given to us and uh, we train a system and then what we do we try to classify some unknown or unseen data so that is the whole idea of this uh, you know classification for classification we can use you know different types of uh, network architectures there we provide x which is the features and uh, corresponding labels for that and uh, so if you are working with images then the transfer learning can help you a lot if you are just interested in developing some system with uh, you know with a sufficient accuracy for that so uh, there are uh, as i told you in the beginning that there are various pre trained architectures available uh, like you can use uh, you know vgg 16 vgg 19 there is mobile uh, nat v2 architecture there is uh inception so the, there are models which have been trained on lakhs of images so if there is some learning uh, uh, on that uh, network you can transfer that for solving your problem and what actually transfer learning is and how it can solve 
you know the problem of classification that we'll discuss tomorrow uh, in the first session but yes you can do that and uh, the image classification challenge uh, which was the image net and later on it was renamed to a large scale object recognition task so there is a annual conference uh, cvpr which is computer computer vision and pattern recognition conference so there is an annual competition on that to recognize those categories so there were 1000 categories in that particular data set and uh, annual competitions used to be you know held uh, for solving that particular problem and since 2012 there is you know improvement on that and uh, today models exist uh, that can reach the accuracy of around 98 or 99% and this particular task is uh, is being considered almost solved so now the people are working on uh, you know video data sets and since you are talking about intrusion detection so visual surveillance is you know one of the emerging fields there and uh, the people are working on activity net data set so activity net net data set is you know the largest data set available as on uh, you know date as far as the volume of the data set is concerned and now there uh, there are various models for recognizing different categories of the activities in a video sequence so uh, some may be normal some may be abnormal and this may help you uh, to get some idea about intrusion detection there, there is a cctv camera which is capturing some footage and uh, out of that uh, you know uh, video footage you can uh, train a model or uh, an already trained model is there which is able to label whether an activity is normal or abnormal or what type of activities are there so if you have mounted a camera which is facing you know one wall or kind of fencing and uh, some people is there who, uh, who want to jump over the wall then automatically it will be able to detect that and that is the you know area where deep learning is penetrating so it is solving the problem of a uh, video classification and uh, labeling the videos the automatic uh, uh, you know uh, video tagging or something like that the video summarization or extracting the key frames from the video or seeing that when some scene changes or something like that so this entire thing is related to video understanding or computer vision understanding and you can use uh, this deep learning for that and it is exclusively better for uh, for 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 doing that and uh, uh, so there are artificial neural networks then came convolutional neural networks and uh, if you want to solve some uh, some time series or some some sort of sequential problems so what is sequential problems suppose there is a text in some book so that is sequentially uh, you know correlated so if you have uh, written i am going so obviously the next uh, next word which will be suggested is to so it means you are going to somewhere to and then if you say school then uh, uh, it, it will it will be able to understand the text and for that you can have recurrent neural networks so there are rnn uh, which are just uh, having some you know feedback loop they take into consideration the previous output as well as the current state and then predict the next output if you want to store it for some you know longer time or you want to uh, keep track of the states then there are lstns and there are gru which is uh, gated recurrent neural networks so for sequential you know data processing we have rnn we have uh, gru we have lstm and uh, if you want to work on this particular you know type of data where some temporality is included it means some sort of time stamping is there so at that particular time uh, you can have even the bidirectional lstm uh, to learn uh, different things in uh, two different directions and uh, yeah for temporal uh, uh, neural networks are also there and there are varieties of you know variants of these architectures for solving specific problems
Yeah, is it clear? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, any other question? Sir? Sir, in, yes. case, in, in deep learning, for classification kind of problems, I mean, what are the latest algorithms or latest techniques has been adopted, sir? Okay. So for classification, uh, uh, basically what is there, you are having a couple of layers. And uh, this particular deep learning means you are creating some model. So it is both an art as well as a science. Because when you are creating some model, so there are different people who have come up with different architectures to solve the same task. Like this is a, there is a task of object uh, classification. And people have chosen one common data set that is ImageNet and that is having 1000 categories of the classes and there are certain images in those different classes. So what they have come up, uh, they've used uh, because the CNN uh, based or the convolutional neural networks or that we collectively called uh, call as ConvNets. So they are the best approaches for, uh, you know, for images and for image classification and they provide you end to end machine learning where you do not have to extract the features so they can work directly on the images now what is there it depends on that how many convolutional uh, layers you are using how many pooling layers you are using what level of dropout you are using how you are applying regularization and when you are applying flattening so depending on you know the combination of layers so the layers are uh, you know fixed so there are 70 80 layers available in this keras api but with those layers the people have come up with you know thousands or even you know uh, hundreds of uh, popular architectures so it depends on that uh, what you are applying when it is just the you know the sequence or the timing of that so i say it that this is also a uh, something related to hit and trial, something related to exploration on the problem and uh, how a particular network architecture uh, turns out to be. Like there is exception uh, uh, architecture, there is VGG 16 architecture, there is VGG 19 architecture, there is ResNet 50 and uh, there is MobileNet V2 architecture. So they are using the, you know, same a uh, set of layers, but their sequencing, their numbers may vary. And based on that, they perform differently and give different accuracy results. So uh, convolutional neural networks are the best, uh, you know, architectures uh, as of now for image classification tasks. But depending on, you know, what type of network architecture you define by using them, that may, uh, that may you know, create a difference. But if you use transfer learning and you just want to create an application like a quick Android application banana that you want to install on some mobile device and that will do some sort of, you know, classification. And the classification may be totally different. Suppose you just want to do uh, crop disease identification for that no, uh, uh, no model has taken that into consideration or you just want to identify uh, the insects, whether the insect is cockroach or it is, you know, mosquito. So for those classes are not included in ImageNet. So still you can use transfer learning and you can train your model with adequate accuracy. Obviously, uh, you know, something more than 90% uh, and you can use that particular model for solving your problem. But if you want to uh, explore it from the research point of view, then you need to, you know, test it, but test it, you need to create your own architecture, you need to compare it with some standard uh, or benchmark data sets available. And then you can come up with some, you know, new ideas and there are various, you know, uh, various scope available for improvement, uh, whether you want to suggest some uh, optimization algorithm, whether you come up with some, you know, loss function and uh, how you are doing that because gradient descent is at the core of this deep learning. And there are hundreds of variants available for that gradient descent. In the same way, 
when we talk about the generative models so gans the idea of generative adversarial network so uh, that came up i think in 2014 or 15 and uh, that has changed uh, you know the thing that how you can perform unsupervised learning for generating images or for generating uh, you know sequence of the text for that but if you even if you come up with some you know alternate of that some alternate approach so it requires extensive testing extensive training on huge data is it clear hope i make some sense Is am I audible? Yes, sir. You are audible. Okay. So uh, then we'll be uh, moving to uh, another concept that is called variational auto encoder. But before that, if you have any, you know, if you want to share something like kind of research problem you are working on, or if you want some input uh, for that then please feel free to ask where deep learning can help you otherwise our next thing is variational auto encoder okay so variational auto encoder is something which is quite interesting that uh, you have some data you learn from that particular data and then you can generate some synthetic data uh, from that particular learning it means suppose you are having a set of you know uh, faces or the images of the faces so you are having suppose 10000 uh, uh, images of the faces and then what you can do you train your model the model will learn the representation from uh, you know that particular data and out of that learning the model will be able to create some uh, new faces which are not existing in the data set so that is something which is uh, you know called as deep fake or deep dream or the people are using that extensively for faking like uh, there are various uh, you know even the mobile apps available where they can generate the synthetic images from your image so they can uh do some sort of changes to that so this variational auto encoder is quite interesting for uh, regenerating uh, some of the images and that's why they are called the generative models so one type of models are uh, gans generative adversarial networks so they can be used for you know for generating some of the text some of the images out of your data so how the variational uh, auto encoder works so you know there is lots of uh, technicality involved in this uh, for understanding that how variational auto encoder uh, you know work but why is this variational and uh, what type of thing it can learn so basically it works uh, we have some data we have some original data that we are feeding to the network and uh, and that needs to be converted into some intermediate representation so here the intermediate representation will be in the form of some probabilistic distribution or in some statistical representation where we will try to figure out that what is the mean and standard deviation uh, of the data that uh, we are dealing with so we'll create a model out of that that we are learning mean and standard deviation uh, from the uh, from the from our data and uh, that we can use for reconstructing the new images from that particular sampling because here we are not learning uh, any new representation of the data but we are just trying to figure out the distribution and from that distribution will take some samples and those samples will be reproduced so it will not produce the actual image but it will try to uh, produce some variant of the existing data so 
that is how uh, the uh, the variational auto encoders work and uh, the intermediate layer that will be using for that learning is called as the bottleneck so in variational auto encoder the bottleneck vector is uh, replaced with two separate vectors one is used for representing the mean uh, of the distribution and another one is used for standard deviation so we take a sample from the distribution and feed it to the model then we try to figure out the loss in variational auto encoder and uh, it has two terms and those terms are basically called as the reconstruction loss and kl divergence so kl divergence is a statistical term which is used to find out the similarity that uh, how similar two distributions are so in nutshell in a you know single line we can understand this uh, like that so this particular formula which is uh, z equals to z mean in plus exponentiation of sigma and epsilon so these will be the three things uh, that will be using for reconstructing some synthetic uh, synthetic data so let's understand that what uh, it is doing in the layman's term okay so here uh, we have some images which are of you know of the size of 28 by 28 we want to convert them into some intermediate dimension of 64 and then we want to have some latent dimension of Two. So these are the three parameters that will go. Uh, you'll understand in a short while that what they mean. What we are doing here, <clears throat> we are defining one input to our, uh, you know, this uh, variational auto encoder, and that is of the size of this original dimension. So the images are of 28 by 28, and that is the original dimension. It means it will be 784. Then we are defining these. Uh, you know layers so one layer is defining our ash and then there is this g underscore mean and g log sigma so what is this ash it is just a, a kind of layer uh, which will be stochastic in nature and rest of the two layers will not be stochastic so uh, once we do it like this it means we convert our intermediate representation into uh, three vectors so these uh, these vectors are mean vector and then standard deviation and uh, out of this mean vector and this standard deviation vector we try to create a sampled vector so that sampled vector will be used for generating the new images okay so how this sampling is being done sampling means that uh, how we are taking this mean and standard deviation and this epsilon into account so this epsilon is just some uh, you know uh, some some uh, some random uh, random data that will be using it but it is fixed and uh, it has to be based on certain median mean and deviation so here we are generating some random data which is having mean uh, equal to zero and its standard deviation is 0 0.1 so that is our epsilon and uh, that has to be the latent variable can be defined in the form of like uh, the latent variable is z so that has to be defined in the form of mu plus sigma and then some operation with epsilon so it has to be done like that so the mu is the uh, mean and uh, sigma is the standard deviation and this epsilon is some sort of uh, you know data generated based on this mean and standard deviation so there is a maths involved behind this that how they work but i just want to show you the output that what actually it can do so here we have defined a you know sampling function and uh, this sampling function is just uh, you know creating these things uh, and it will create a latent vector and that will be in this particular form so it will be z mean plus k into exponentiation of this particular sigma and uh, 
so so, so k is just acting as a uh, back end so it is keras and the log sigma plus epsilon and then we are defining this particular latent representation so this latent representation is nothing but it is just the sampling out of the data and then we can define encoders and decoders for that but here this is our input and this is our output so output instead of you know uh, producing one output it will be producing the mean and the sigma and uh, the, the final uh, you know latent vector z and we are just giving it as name of encoder let's compile this so here we are reconstructing so we are just keeping here the number of epochs equals to 10 only because it will take you know some time in learning and what we will do we will just try to it is the old output try to generate some of the images out of this learning so in simple language how does this variational auto encoder work so various variational auto encoder is based on the you know the statistical sampling and uh, how the sampling is there like suppose you are having milk you just condensed it so you are not making the milk from the uh, from the you know the the condensed powder what you are doing you will just take a sample from that particular powder and you will try to test in the lab it means you are going to perform some statistics on this like what is the formation what is the nutritional values how much is the calcium here and in what order we need to produce it so you are just taking the sample from the milk you are not uh, you know from the powder you are not uh, taking the powder and making milk out of that so you will try to study the formation of that particular powder in the uh, based on its properties like what are the different types of uh, you know elements available here in what proportion they are how much is the fat and uh, what is the texture what is the material science qualities of that and based on that particular you know learning you try to uh, regenerate uh, uh, something out of that something from that latent uh, you know learning and you want to form uh, you 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 just want to form milk out of that particular learning so what is there there is input then you are converting into some intermediate representation and then that intermediate representation needs to be converted into three layers one is learning mean another one is learning standard deviation and then there is uh, latent vector which is uh, just coming out of as the combination of them which is mu plus sigma in some operation and then uh, the epsilon and then you are just trying to uh, make uh, milk out of that particular learning so it means you are trying to reconstruct and definitely there will be variations so something that you have learned from the data and uh, suppose that data is containing some images you are taking sampling from those images and then try to create some more images out of that so that will be some sort of synthetic uh, you know data that is going to be generated and that's why these auto encoders are also called as the generative encoders or generative models so here our uh, training has been performed but since uh, we just performed the training till 10 epochs so here you can see that our learning from the data is not that much 
so what we were expecting uh, you know from there so the, still there is a huge loss of 154 uh, and something so it should be something less than one in idle case but still there is huge loss because we are just creating samples we are just creating the original data from a statistical sample and uh, that has lots of uh, you know uh, scope for improvement but once you uh, you know try to reconstruct then what type of synthetic images you can get so for that we are creating some synthetic images And these are the synthetic images, the random synthetic images. So here you can see that these images do not exist in our data set. So here you can see that how this three has been, you know, reconstructed in three dimensional, uh, you know, space. So here you can see that uh, it is something like three. It has learned something from the three and uh, from out of that sampling, the three could be learned. It is just something related to seven and one. So it is there and uh, it is related to zero because uh, there were eight was having this particular, you know, symbol, nine was having this particular symbol. So whatever it learned from there. So it has tried to figure out this, uh, you know, this circle from that particular data. And since these lines were also the, available in most of the, you know, images like nine was having this line one was having seven was having so these are some of the synthetic images so the same thing you can apply even on the face uh, you know data set which is available on uh, celebrity face data set and people have used it to uh, to generate some of the fake images out of that and uh, that is something the deep fake or the some of the style transfer, you can use it. The, the GANs are used for style transfer and, uh, you know, something like that. So this is something which is, uh, you know, latest your generative models are latest and also in their inception phase, they are just in the phase of improvement. And uh, so this was something to get you started with the idea of uh, encoders and how variational auto encoders can work and since it is something that we started from in between but I'm not sure that uh, how much uh, comfortable you are with Keras and this deep learning so but if you just want to explore this then lots of you know resources are available uh, for that so if you want to learn Keras, so I told you that keras.io is the official website and there you'll find everything that you need to learn. Lots of examples there that how to get started with, how to do classification, how to use deep learning for regression. And this is something which is uh, sort of unsupervised or called of self-supervised or representational learning uh, where the people are uh, into the research and trying to find out the various use cases for uh, this uh, this representational learning. So what are the some of the applications for this? Like you can generate some synthetic data. Uh, you can use it for denoising. Uh, so not much uh, applications, application areas have been, uh, you know, found as far as these auto encoders are considered, but uh, there is, you know, a lot remains to be explored and maybe in four years or five years, the people are working in this, this, uh, you know, the generative modeling and uh, it poses various concerns about, about the security because the, uh, if the data is available, if the people get to access to your fingerprints, so they can generate, uh, you know, billions of the replicas of your fingerprints and then can use a system to train and to represent your fingerprint and it can be used for hacking. So most of the uh, access control systems take into account the 3D construction of your face, uh, like uh, the access in your mobile phone. So uh, many of the mobile phones have this face unlock. So the people can reconstruct something out of your faces and then can uh, would be able to reconstruct the 3D version of that. So it may cause various, you know, concerns for that. 
and uh, uh, the people are able to construct the images of other people other persons who actually do not exist but they are quite you know quite identical to the human beings and uh, they are even taking the features from various other other people so it can be uh, misused like you can apply this in video and then you know uh, do kind of morphing seamlessly and it will be very difficult to tell whether the the video or whatever the audio whether it was tampered or it was the original one so deep fake uh, poses various challenges various problems and uh, the people are skeptical whether the ai is going to be you know good or there are some consequences uh, the bad consequences coming out of that as well so this is quite interesting you can explore uh, you know these things uh, further and if you have any questions then please ask as i think we have already overrun the time sir there is a question in chat box asking for what kind of models are suitable for speech data okay all right so what kind of models are suitable for speech data so in speech what type of uh, you know what you want to perform because if you talk about speech uh, recognition then the hmm models have been the you know the obvious choice for that hidden markov models but since speech is a sequential data so the first thing is that that uh, if you are able to convert speech into some a numerical representation with some of the preprocessing uh, you know techniques so then you can use even the deep learning uh, with that and uh, you can use other uh, methods for that so it depends on whether uh, the problem is of classification whether the problem is of uh, you know some generative modeling sort of or the problem is some refinement or something like that so if you just want to Uh, you know convert the text into speech or you just want to recognize the speech then uh, you can even use deep learning and uh, rnns have been extensively used for the speech recognition tasks and uh, they can be clubbed with the uh, the learning that we are getting from uh, hidden markov models so the markov chain is a different uh, you know phenomena that is best suited for for this speech uh, processing okay so explore that how deep learning can help you you can use rnn lstm for this because if you are working with the you know the sequence of the data yes is it clear yes variational auto encoders can work for image enhancement yes they can be used for image enhancement and uh, denoising or despeckling is you know one of the uh, use cases where they can use you can even uh, use them for uh, improving the brightness crispness of the images so they can work there but since uh, these auto encoders are just in the you know inception phase there are various limitations associated with them the first and obvious limitation is that that they can work only uh, one type of auto encoder or encoder decoder can work only a specific on a specific type of data even if you want to use it as a compression mechanism so they are not universal like uh, jpeg or mpeg uh, compression standards so for every type of uh, you know data or type of images you you need to create uh, the the model separately and they are not universal and for 
image denoising you can use them the people uh, it is one of the very popular use case of auto order for image denoising you can uh, use them for even creating super resolution images uh, along with generative adversarial networks so they can find uh, applications in those areas as well okay any other question that is related to your area or if you want to uh, know that we can apply deep learning somewhere how to apply yes, it hi sir yes yes please sir actually my data uh, actually i'm working on some intrusion detection part my data set contain the ip addresses protocols some uh, these kind of data okay so right now i am working on machine learning now i am uh, i mean i mean the plan to uh, move to deep learning to apply deep learning algorithms okay so i mean what are the solutions like for classification of these kind of uh, data set which algorithms are better suits and what are the advancements we can i mean what are the best algorithms we can adopt for okay. these kind of uh, problems okay so uh, if you talk about this uh, you know the nature of the data set or the data that you are working with so there will be different pieces of information like uh, some uh, numbers and uh, some special characters in between like colon and uh, other things so yes, yes. Uh, we will be treating this as the text data and uh, it will be having some of the email addresses or some of the domain names and something like that so for that what you can do you can do some sort of preprocessing with the uh, you know nlp there are different types of Uh, nlp libraries and uh, like uh, there is a concept called as named entity recognition ner in uh, the in the field of uh, text processing so what it can do it can try to figure out the different types of entities so if we talk about a normal text uh, and we need to find out the what are the different entities then it can automatically there are you know trained embeddings for doing that Uh, so it can figure out that what are the names of the people what are the different names of the places and uh, and it, it can give you uh, uh, that thing so in the same way you need to define some sort of you know representation or some sort of uh, you know ex feature extraction sort of thing from your data like how many are the you know where is the ip address where is the email address where is the uh, web url and uh, from where uh, what was the name of the server or the node from uh, where some you know possible attack was initiated so out of that data so you need to represent it uh, something which is meaningful you can do some sort of feature extraction from that particular data and uh, if you if you want to just perform end to end means uh, machine learning so you can use deep learning but in deep learning it will just treat uh, for classification like uh, there are some uh, you know some sort of emails that you just want to uh, classify whether it is spam or not so what you you'll do you need to identify some of the classes like if you want to do uh, some sort of uh, classification based on that whether this was spoofing uh, this was uh, some sort of cracking or some sort of hacking or what type of attempt it was so you can classify that and you can keep your data in uh, at one place and then you can just feed it to some embedding layer that will extract or convert it into uh, you know numerical representation but before that as i told you you can do named entity recognition or some uh, some uh, something like that like i worked on one project uh, like that that was the classification of cvs uh, based on the Uh, you know the different requirements of the jobs so there were some specification related to the expertise the qualification the the experience number of years experience and the cvs were in different formats so some were just having tabular representation some were having you know just a kind of paragraph or point wise representation so i did named uh, entity recognition to figure out or to extract this particular data that what is 
the experience of a person uh, what is the qualification of a person what is the email id what is the mobile number what is the address and that uh, the ai can do that so after doing that then you can just figure it out whether the candidate is suitable or not uh, for a specific type of job opening so you have some features with you you have some data with you and then you have labels corresponding to that and if you want to use deep learning then you can just uh, feed it to the uh, deep learning and since deep learning models are end to end it means they do not require the feature extraction so there are different intermediate layers embedding and uh, uh, others so you can extract features on the go and then can do classification on that okay so uh, the next page i'm working on mri scans for medical imaging how can i do it so obviously uh, what you want to do on mri whether you want to uh, you know detect some disease or you want just uh, a classification on that so there are uh, you know various things on that like uh, there is multi label classification as well like you are inputting one image and then there may exist various types of disease so how to do that so first you need to you know figure out that you need to read about that whether you want to find out multiple uh, multiple uh, diseases from an image or you just want to uh, find out single disease from the image so that is the the first thing is uh, this that is to be decided if you just want to find out you know uh, or level one disease so what you need to have you just need to have Uh, the labeled data with you whether these are the mris uh, that are having this you know sort of anomaly or this particular disease these are the samples that do not have this sort of disease so even if you just want to uh, you know train a single class or just one uh, kind of detection system still you need to have two classes uh, one set where the disease will exist and one set where the disease will not exist you need to have their separation and then you need to uh, perform cnn or any type or a simple ann uh, for that as well because you can have any uh, you know any level of tensors you can even process video data with just uh, just the tensors so obviously there is convolutional 3d con uh, 2d and con 1d layer but if even if your data is 60 or 70 or 8d then you can process that with simple uh, you know neural network and for that you need to define your tensors uh, tensors like that in that particular you know dimension so i'm working uh, with auto encoder help in reconstructing uh, you know these images for analysis and classification yes you can do you know some sort of <clears throat> enhancement on that and uh, you can even you uh, do some sort of segmentation with a combination of you know techniques like self driving cars are using uh, uh, you know this uh, supervised unsupervised deep learning where they are doing some sort of semantic segmentation uh, in the images you can do that And I think there are more queries. Please go ahead. Even if you have any other queries, the uh, the professor will be available tomorrow morning also with uh, two more uh, in, uh, topics. So you can ask him. And yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, Bula, can you just conclude? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir, for a very informative session on advanced deep learning concepts. And the way you taught each and everything was very nice and easily understandable. On behalf of all the participants, I would like to extend my hearty thanks for your time and the knowledge you shared. It will be a great pleasure for all of us to listen to you again in the future, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you all once again. 
Thank you all once again for joining with us and I hope you all enjoyed today's session. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the days. Until then, bye bye. So with this, uh, we conclude for the day and tomorrow morning sharply by 10 o'clock, we start the session. Till then, good day.